First of all, for programs we use Ableton Live and for VSTs and plugins, mainly we use Massive Native, Native Instruments, Massive for our bass sounds and sometimes melodies. We also use Omnisphere, Silent, Silent, however you want to produ or pronounce it, for melodies and FX. We use uh, um, some effect plugins like Ohm Boys, the whole Ohm Suite, um, and just uh, uh, just a number of uh, different random plugins. But mainly, our main one is like massive for sure. As for how we got into dubstep, um, basically before Mantis existed, we weren't producing any other type of music. Paul and I had no experience whatsoever when it came to electronic music or producing dubstep or anything like not house or techno or anything basically before mantis we were both in metal bands and um that's why i think we were drawn to dubstep so much because metal at least in our music and similar types of dubstep uh it has such a metal influence you know when it comes to you know breakdowns or some or you know slow chug parts there's a lot of stuff like that in dubstep so i think that's why we were attracted to it so much so after we left our metal bands, we were just drawn to dubstep, and we basically downloaded Ableton, watched a bunch of YouTube videos on how to uh, how to produce and mix and stuff, and um, I guess that's really all that happened. We just um, sat down for like weeks at a time and just watched videos and messed with Ableton like nonstop until we finally started getting sort of good at it and um and now here we are so yeah that's what we did as we had mentioned before we both came from metal backgrounds so obviously heavy music like that is always going to take a huge role in how we write our music and influence us and of course we are influenced by some you know other dubstep producers um, me personally Rusko and Bass Nectar like were like the first artists I heard that made the bridge in my mind between how metal and elements and dubstep elements could be put together Rusko, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Rusko's tune Mr. Muscle was like one of the earlier dubstep tunes and it was probably obviously the heaviest bass music I had ever heard when I first heard it, and that's what inspired me to write the, the write how I do now. I personally love working with Paul, or just any other person really. Like I, I think two people working together as opposed to one can bring its um, advantages, because obviously you get two people's answer, I mean ideas, um, coming in, you know, and combining and you get his creativeness with my creativeness and it just pours into this song. Um, but yeah, we do disagree sometimes, but normally um, we kind of compromise and it ends up working out very well because, like I said, we get his ideas and my ideas together. So yeah, I really like working with Paul. We're going to have to say Ruthless, and mainly it's because um, Ruthless sort of tells a story, we think, and um, it's different because Ruthless is a combination of hip-hop and drum step, which is a little different. Um, the song is also really progressive, like, throughout the whole song it kind of keeps going to a new part and a new part, but still it's all tied together. Um, and, like, halfway through, or a little after halfway through, it goes into, like, a complete metal breakdown and then right back into like hip hop, like it's just a lot of um, different parts all fused together, but it works really well, so I think that's why it's our favorite song right now. And um, also, it is coming out on Ultra Gore on our uh, EP actually titled Ruthless, um, hopefully it'll be out within the next few months this year. I went to the Art Institute of Atlanta for audio production for probably three years or something. I actually didn't graduate and get my degree um, because I ended up quitting um, and then that's when I got into Mantis a little bit later. But the reason I quit is because I didn't really 
I didn't really feel like they inspired creativity a lot at the Art Institute. For example, when you got assigned a project, you had to say you had to record a band or something. You had to do it a specific way. You had to set up the mics this way or this way. And they, if if I wanted to try something my own way and you know try something new or try you know something that I had read somewhere else, like they they wouldn't really allow that, or if you did it, you would get points off, and so they didn't like creativity, it seemed like to me, so after a while, I withdrew from the Art Institute, and then um, I got Mantis shortly after. I did learn a lot there when it comes to just about audio and mixing and um, recording. I think the last year that I didn't go, like, what I missed was mastering, you know, like, really advanced mastering and stuff, so that's what I didn't get, but, um, I did learn a lot about recording and mixing and stuff, but like I said, they weren't going the direction that I wanted to go, really, so as for, um, the degree that I, that I didn't get, you asked if, if, uh, if that degree really matters and, and can you get a job afterwards, and... I think having that piece of paper can definitely help. Like if um if you go to a studio to get a job and it's you and another guy, you both are ex like equally talented. You have a very similar portfolio, and it's basically you versus him. You will probably win and get the job if you have your degree, and as opposed to if he doesn't have a have a degree. But it really boils down to mainly who you know in this industry, I mean, who you know is a really big part of stuff, so I've learned, and how talented and, and creative you are, I mean, creativity is a huge deal in this industry, if you just go into a studio and just follow textbook rules, I mean, you're not going to offer anything new to the table, you're not going to be, you're not going to stand out, you're not going to be anything special, you're just going to be another textbook engineer, which some people want that, I guess, but other people want something new, different, and basically, if you have your degree, yeah, you can easily get a job. You can get a job being a studio engineer, you can go and do film music, um, video games, you know, you can do sound, any type of sound in any industry, really. Um, but yeah, if you and if you don't have a degree, you can do what I did and just uh, start producing dubstep and whatnot. Who knows what I'm going to do after this. Hopefully I will know someone by then since I don't have a degree. This this is really serious for me because a lot of things deep down inside me. I think I would fly for Nagalta Air Company. They seem to be a really great company, you know, for who I am and what I want to do. And as for what airplane I would fly, or what airplane I would be, I guess, I would definitely have to say I would be a Frank plane. For those of you who don't know, a Frank plane is a plane powered by men named Frank. Um, they turn wheels down under the deck, um, and I think I would definitely have to be a Frank plane. Uh, you know, it's something I've always dreamed about being. Uh, and, you know, maybe one day I could be a Frank Plane, you know, I think about it all the time. Advice for fattening up your sounds is layering. Hey, but when I say layering, that doesn't just mean, you know, duplicate a bunch of things on top of each other so it just sounds thicker. Just because it sounds thicker doesn't mean it sounds better. You have to, you know, pan things accordingly you know, depending on the frequency ranges that they encompass. And that really, you know, boils down to, you know, practicing a lot and just f experimenting a lot. There's no secret formula for, like, making something sound good. It all comes from sitting, taking the time, and, you know, tweaking and tweaking and tweaking until you finally get that perfect mix. But what I could suggest to somebody really, you know, trying to begin with that is, you know, get like a kind of, you know, thick sound and keep it in the center and then, you know, have your mid mid to high range register sounds mostly in the center but pan them out to the left and to the right a little bit and EQ them differently so that they, you know, each offer a unique character to the overall sound. And on that note, a little bit of bass on your EQ 
use goes a long way. Don't overdo the bass because it's going to phase out your sub bass and it's going to sound like shit. And on the note of like making the sounds choppy, there's a number of ways you can do that. Obviously, you can automate within your VST synth of choice the, um, the rate and make it faster and adjust the cutoff to where it doesn't go as long. But one trick that we found out or I guess not not really say found out, but just I just kind of stumbled across, and obviously this isn't anything new, so I'm not claiming that I am innovative in any way. But you like draw out your MIDI notes and the pattern you want, like say you want an eighth note wobble pattern or whatever, you just do a bunch of eighth notes, and then if you want to have them like chop a little bit, you can just select them all, and then turn off your grid, and then shorten all of the notes at once. At least in Ableton, you know, that obviously depends on what DAW you're using, but um, I think in most of them you could probably do something similar in that regard, especially with your sub bass. Like if you want that machine gun really fast sub bass note, rather than trying to make massive or whatever synth you're using do it within the, the plugin, doing it with the MIDI notes is actually a lot better and seems to be more effective, at least from our experience. Basically, we each start um, a song at you know our house. Um, like for example, I'll start a song, work my way through it, um, probably get like 50% done or something. And um, meanwhile, while I'm writing it, I'm sending every bounce to Paul and showing him what I've gotten done. And then after a while, after um, I've worked on it a good bit, um, Paul will come over to my house and uh, he'll put in his input, he'll sit down and add what he wants to do and add his um, creative ideas and all. And basically we just do that, like he'll come over to my house and work on my song after I've done it and then I'll go over to his house and work on a song that he's done. And basically we just do that back and forth until a song is done and that's pretty much what we do. Taylor's taking a nap on a whale right now. What? <laughs> yep, he's taking a nap on a whale. I'm waiting for the shower. Another question we both get a fair amount is people want to know, you know, what they can start doing to get noticed or get exposure or things like that. I'm going to have to say right off the bat that, and this is in no way to sound self-contrived or anything, but you have to be offering something that people want. People, you know, you have, bottom line is you have to create something that people respond positively to. That's not all there is. There's certainly a, more, a lot more that goes into it, but... The end all be all is that you know you gotta come up with something that is at least you know considered, I guess, marketable, and it's a shit such a shitty word to use for that, but it's you know that's how it is. But um, how we at least got started was you know we had a SoundCloud, we you know made some tunes, put them up, and you know sent them off to a couple of groups at a time because when you first get a regular SoundCloud account, you can't send to lots of groups and shit like that. Um, obviously, we also had a Facebook page that we started and, you know, started posting on our personal accounts and that account and, you know, share, sharing the page to our friends, asking people to like the page, you know. After a little while, we um, upgraded our SoundCloud account and then we were able to send to, you know, up to 75 groups and that really helped us get more, like, exposure and plays and comments and stuff like that, at least on SoundCloud. Really, you know, there's no social medium that you should ignore as far as where to put your music and push it to people. We have a YouTube channel, a Twitter account, a Facebook page, um, I think a couple other things that we don't really use very well because, you know, it's kind of hard to keep up with it all of it, but um, really social, social networking and everything is the best thing you can do. And also, my biggest recommendation to aspiring new producers and stuff like that is if you, you know, say you're friends with a producer you like on Facebook, don't send them your shit and be like, hey man, check this out, you know, if you don't know them. 
I'm speaking from personal experience. I did it when I was first getting started, and you know, you know, it kind of, it's not just not a good look, you know. If you're gonna send something to somebody, finish it. Make sure you're ten thousand percent confident in that product that you're trying to get somebody to check out, because with with anything and everything, first impressions mean a great deal. So if you're gonna send send something all over to somebody who who you see as like really influential to you or really established or whatever, the biggest recommendation I can have is to send over something you're really confident with and not something that's just like, you know, you sounds like you worked on it for 20 minutes. A lot of times, you know, of course people will ask how you go about, you know, getting the attention of labels and stuff like that. And obviously there's always the route that you can send things to like their Dropbox, you know, demo, submission, emails, things like that. Labels definitely look at those and certainly, you know, go through things that they get. But the best thing you can do is to make your own noise enough to where they want to come to you. Because that's what that that's what's really gonna, you know, set it up for you is because at that point you already have the leverage. Another thing that can really greatly benefit you is your live show and like how you perform live and how you interact with the crowd and all of that. I think one thing that really, you know, helped helped us get where we are, at least definitely as far as establishing ourselves in our hometown Atlanta is, you know, every single show we get up there and we give it 100%, you know. Like we we make our music and we we put 100% of ourselves into it when we're making it and we want to put like, you know, 10,000% of ourselves into it when we're playing it live. And the more you can engage the crowd and make the crowd really feel like, you know, they're at, they're, they're, they're experiencing something more than just a DJ standing up there playing music, the more they're willing to talk about you and the more you're more, more likely to get booked. I just wanted to address something so people understand maybe that don't understand how being an artist works and bookings work and all that stuff and going to new destinations. Like for example, a lot of people will write on our wall, come to Canada or come to New Zealand or something like that. We would love to go everywhere, but it's we can't just go there and be like, hey, we're gonna play. Like literally how it has to work is like, there has to be a demand for us in that place so that promoters are receptive to that demand and then you know, make the booking process begin. So really the best thing anyone can do if they want us to come play somewhere is to just, you know, spam the shit out of your local promoters with our music or whatever and tell them to check it out. Tell your friends about us. You know, the more people that know about it, you know, the more likely it is that we'll be able to go more places and play for more people. We've already gotten to go a lot of places and play for a lot of awesome people, so, you know, we're just excited to go more and more new places. So tell your friends. And last but not least, we're about to unload a shitload of free music on everybody. So we're really excited to give back to, to all you guys who have supported us, you know, since the beginning. So stay tuned. More videos and shit are going to be coming soon. Um, 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 we produce on, um, 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 um.